Yeah, good. Hey, we want to welcome you to Covenant Baptist Church tonight. Thank you for coming and joining in with us. Uh, we're having the Constitution class tonight, and it's good to have Evan Mulch with us, and he's from the John Birch Society. And I'm going to get him to come up in just a moment, and he's going to explain a little bit to you about the John Birch Society and then also what we're going to be going through over the next six weeks. It'll be each Monday night for the next six weeks from 6.30 until 8 o'clock. And, there, and those of you that would like to join us on Facebook Live, we appreciate you doing that. And so uh, if you want to try to get some of the materials that we have, the handouts, if you'll let us know, call into the office, and we'll be glad to uh, get that for you. Uh, but we appreciate you joining in with us this evening. Uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessings on our time together. And so let's pray. Uh, fathers, we come to you in prayer tonight. We thank you for the privilege that we have uh, to come together tonight to learn about our Constitution. Uh, we just thank you for Evan Mulch, and we ask your blessings upon his dear wife uh, as she is uh, seven months pregnant now. We just pray, God, that things will go well, that they'll have a healthy child, and we just pray, God, that you'll bless his uh, ministry, Father, as he works with the John Birch Society. And, and Father, I pray that you'll bless him tonight as he comes and shares just for a few moments about uh, about uh, what we're going to be observing over the next six weeks. And again, Lord, we thank you for your many blessings upon the United States of America. And we pray especially tonight uh, for the people in Ukraine and uh, also for the situation there with the Russian uh, Russians government, with uh, Putin, and, and God, all those that are uh, just trying to, to cause havoc in that area of the world. Uh, we pray, God, that, that peace will prevail. Uh, we just pray, God, that you will just bless our leadership in America, that we'll do the right things uh, that need to be done. And Father, again, we thank you for your many blessings of life. May you bless tonight as we uh, go through this class and over the next uh, classes over the next several weeks. And we'll praise you, Lord, for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. Evan, if you will come up and uh, you can share more about yourself and then also about the John Burt Society. We appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Whew. I'm excited. Okay, so um, as Americans, we were blessed from the start. Um, we had a constitutional convention. Uh, George Washington presided over it, and we were given this small constitution to obey. Isn't that amazing? So, so everybody still to this day takes an oath to that constitution. I know we've had, I think, a congresswoman that took an oath on something else, but um, you know, everybody takes an oath to this constitution. If they were to obey it, if, if all congressmen obey this, we would not be dealing with the process, the problems we face today. And so uh, it's rather easy to obey the Constitution. It just needs to be taught correctly. And so that's what we're here to do today. Um, I got involved because I noticed about 10 years ago some things with America were really wrong. And I was about 30 years old, and I thought, man, I don't want my family to live through communism. I just paid $4 for a bell pepper at the grocery store, and I'm, I think we're getting pretty close to communism right now, you know. Inflation is here, right? And so um, we've, we've got a lot of thinking to do, as, especially as for, for those that are watching this that are believers, for those that uh, believe that where there is Christ, there is liberty. As the Bible teaches us, we, we, we as Christian believers have a duty to provide um, peace, and as much freedom and liberty to people as possible. Now, there's some, there's some points where we can't. There's too much tyranny. We just got to do our best. Endure until the end is what I believe. And that's, I believe it's found in, in the New Testament as well. So you've, you've got to, um, uh, if, if you want to find this on your own, we do have it available on jbs.org. That's John Birch Society website, jbs.org. And you can go to the Education tab, and you click on the U.S. Constitution. I think it's called the Constitution Solution. But you, you, if, if you don't want to, if you want to share this with your relatives, you know, um, people in the community, and you want to get them started, they can self-study this on their own. But it's best when we come together to study, because we, we learn more when we work as a group on, on uh, the Constitution is the Solution workshop. Um, I've done dozens of these workshops all over South Carolina. I've got field coordinators that do them across America right now. And, and I did not invent this, but I saw what was created, and I said, I'm going to take this all over the place because I think this is the very tool all Americans need to um, teach the Constitution at their churches, in their living rooms, uh, wherever they want to. Now, John Birch was a um, Christian missionary from Georgia. So John Birch is a famous 
a hero. Well, he should be famous. Uh, unfortunately, the government doesn't want you to know about John Birch. He was a he was a Baptist from Georgia who was a missionary in China before World War II, and he saved Jimmy Doolittle when Jimmy Doolittle crash landed into China. And so, uh, John Birch um, became a hero, but he was killed by Chinese communists after World War II. And so, um, one, uh, um, you know. The federal government covered up his death, and here we are today. A lot of people don't know who he is. You'll find out who he is in this video. Not today, but in a coming video. And uh, we can go ahead and get started. This video is about uh, 45 minutes long, and we'll do a quiz afterwards. And anyways, um, we'll, we'll have questions afterwards. So I'm a little bit out of breath. <laughs> Been a long day. So, uh, but I hope you all enjoy this. Good to go. Can we get started? Welcome to lecture number one, The Dangers of Democracy. I find that the title of this lecture alone is sometimes a little bit surprising to people because we are taught that in this nation we have a democracy, we're a democratic form of government. Probably the first place we need to really start with an understanding of the Constitution is with an understanding of what our founding fathers meant when they used certain words. A great quote from Joseph Sobran helps us with this. He says, one of the great goals of education is to initiate the young into the conversation of their ancestors, to enable them to understand the language of that conversation in all its subtlety. We find that many of the writings of the Founding Fathers, particularly the Federalist Papers, are written in a language that's a little foreign to many of the people in our nation today. It's Old English, it's often very verbose in the way they wrote, it's a little difficult for us to understand. Throughout these six lectures, we'll talk about some of the words that our Founding Fathers used and what those words meant to them at that time. In particular, starting with the word democracy versus republic. As we turn in the U.S. Constitution to Article 4, Section 4, it says, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. You may recall that as we pledge our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the next line says, and to the republic, not a democracy. We were founded as a republic, and it's interesting to find the difference between the two and what the founders were so intent on preventing. They wanted to make sure that we were not a democracy. And I was quite surprised to learn some of the things our founders said. For example, James Madison saying, a democracy is the most vile form of government. I was raised believing that a democracy was the pinnacle. This was the ideal. This is the best form of government. And yet they had a very different view of this. Probably the best place to go to understand the difference between a democracy and a republic is a video produced by the John Birch Society a few years ago called Overview of America. This was produced by John McManus, the president of the John Birch Society. The United States of America. Born in 1776, our country is the offspring of a religious-based heritage of liberty under law. Blessed with great natural resources and a pioneer people given to industry and moral discipline, our nation grew to be strong and prosperous and developed the finest governmental system ever devised by man. America soon became known as the refuge of the world's tired, hungry, and poor. Millions left everything in the old world to start over in a land that rewarded initiative and hard work and perseverance. The many millions who didn't come here found comfort and hope in knowing that indeed there was such a bastion of freedom and opportunity, a place where dreams could become reality. 
Today, our nation appears wealthier and more powerful than ever. New technologies have revolutionized our daily lives. Luxuries once enjoyed only by the rich are commonplace and very affordable. Home ownership is widespread and our people have the expectation of continued economic growth and prosperity. Yet more and more people are coming to realize that they may prosper materially only for a time because their freedoms are diminishing. The sobering reality is that America has been led far from its praiseworthy beginnings. Our people and businesses groan under a heavy burden of economic, political and social problems, which are the result of a widespread departure from the fundamental truths that made our nation great. If the United States of America is to endure, citizens far and wide must once again come to understand, embrace and live by timeless concepts concepts called Americanism. What made America great and set it apart from other lands? Was it natural resources? No, other lands are equally blessed. Was it the people? No, the people who built America came from elsewhere. Was it government planning and wisdom that spurred our nation to such heights? No again. It wasn't what government did that made America great. It was what government was prevented from doing that made the difference. What set America apart from other lands was freedom for the individual. Freedom to work, to produce, to succeed, and especially to keep the fruits of one's labors. America became great precisely because the stifling effect of too much government had been prevented. However, freedom in America was not totally unrestrained. Americans overwhelmingly chose to limit their actions with moral codes such as the Ten Commandments, personal morality and limited government. It's a combination that characterized America and made it the envy of the world. When our founding fathers decided they'd had enough of British oppression, they broke away and declared independence. They stated as self-evident truth in the Declaration of Independence that men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In other words, God gave man his rights, and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the very next sentence, the founders defined the proper role of government when they stated that to secure these rights, governments are instituted. This is the entire philosophical base of our nation. Here, the government cannot legitimately redistribute the wealth, assume power over the people's lives, and dominate man's existence with oppressive taxation, regulations, and controls. According to the founders, government was to be a negative force, which leaves people alone. Its sole function is to protect citizens from one another and from foreign governments, and especially from their own government itself. The founders did not create a government to be a positive force to do things for people, to take from some, to give to others. They understood that when a government starts doing something for one citizen, it has to take from another to do so. And in the process, it gains control over both. Britain's rulers didn't accept the Declaration of Independence, so our forefathers had to fight a war to make it stick. By 1783, the War for Independence had been won, and British forces were sent back across the sea. But the governmental system at that time was weak. It had no power to settle disputes between the states, nor the power to tax for proper needs, such as national defense. So in 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia to revise the system. And they produced an entirely new governmental structure known as the Constitution of the United States keeping faith with the thunderous assertions in the Declaration. The Constitution was written to govern the government, not the people, and not the states, each of which was a jealous guardian of its own sovereignty. The founders created a central government with strictly limited powers. 
This left the states free to compete with one another to be the best state, the one with the least amount of taxation and controls, one where citizens would want to build a business and raise a family. That spirit of competition produced excellence, as honest competition always does. It's important to note that the Constitution wasn't forced on the people. It was sent back to the states for ratification, and several of the Founding Fathers wrote essays explaining it in an effort to persuade fellow Americans to adopt this new system of government. Some of the essays written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay were collected into a volume known as the Federalist Papers. Those essays provide valuable insights into the intent of the Founders in establishing our government. Eventually, all 13 states ratified the Constitution, and then each ratified the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights, further tying the hands of the federal government. These amendments are indeed about rights, but it would have been better had the Bill of Rights been labeled the Bill of Limitations on Government. Why? Because it's vital to realize that the Bill of Rights never gave citizens any rights whatsoever. Its sole purpose was to safeguard God-given rights by limiting government power. The founders even insisted that Congress shall make no law about speech, religion, the press, assembly, the right to petition, the right to keep and bear arms, and so on. These amendments are directed squarely at the federal government, not the individual and not the states. They are like most of the Ten Commandments, which are essentially thou shall nots. The Bill of Rights says Congress shall not, shall not, shall not, all the way up to the marvelous Tenth Amendment, which says in effect, if we forgot anything, you can't do that either. When Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Toward the middle of the political spectrum can be found the type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by a few, democracy ruled by a majority, republic ruled by law, and anarchy, which is ruled by no one. In discussing these five, we'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in the practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't ruled by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's ruled by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never truly exists. Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history. And it is the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few, and therefore oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments. So they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this is a mistake, because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed 
and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized orderly society. In a state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty and property and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired someone to do the guarding, a sheriff, a police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting, and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to those best able to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then create a government run by them, an oligarchy, where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power, and in Germany where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power hungry. It's a temporary condition, and because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos meaning people and kratian meaning to rule. Democracy therefore means the rule of the people, majority rule. This of course sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home or business or children. Obviously there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? Well, that comes from the Latin. Res meaning thing and publica meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is one where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the Founding Fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic, not the rule of a majority in a democracy. Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. 35 horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him, and they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed, and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him. But the sheriff arrives and he says, you can't kill him, he's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town. A jury of his peers is selected and they hear the evidence and the defense and they decide if he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule? No, it has to be unanimous or he goes free. The rights of the government aren't subject to majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution. Nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Alexander Hamilton agreed and he stated, we are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. And John Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence stated, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt 
because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Just as there is widespread confusion regarding political systems, there is similar confusion in the economic arena. All during the 20th century, Americans were led to believe that there was a great struggle going on between capitalism and the communist world. Undoubtedly, a struggle existed, but the real adversaries were rarely identified properly. No discussion about economic systems will make sense without first defining terms. And one of the most basic terms in economics is capital, whose definition is the means of production. To illustrate what capital is, let's consider a very simple economy. On the sands of a small island, a castaway has just washed the shore. He has no food and he's hungry. He searches the island, he finds no berries, coconuts, or anything edible. He goes back into the water and tries to catch fish with his bare hands, but he fails. So he goes back up on shore, he finds a bush. He breaks off a branch, he gnaws at one end to make a sharp tip. Back into the water he goes, and with his spear, he catches fish. His spear is capital. It's the means of production for catching fish. He gave up some of his time and some of his energy to produce something he could not eat, but something that would help him to produce something that he could eat. Capital, therefore, can be tools, machinery, and even a man's handmade spear to catch fish. Such being the case, consider that the communists in the former Soviet Union, as well as in China and Cuba, have always used tools and machinery. Officials there even view people as capital. Therefore, by strict definition, are not communists capitalists? For that matter, isn't everyone a capitalist? And so, is not every economic system a capitalist system? What then is the difference between what the communist system is and what the American capitalist system is supposed to be? The difference is ownership of the capital. Is the system monopolistic, state-controlled capitalism? Or is it competitive, free enterprise capitalism? It is between these two opposing economic systems that a battle has always raged. Before we proceed, 
Let's also define free market. Basically, it's a self-regulating system in which all parties are completely free to transact with one another. But where force, fraud, or injury damages one party, the government's role is only to punish those who commit such offenses and to vindicate the rights of the other party. This protects the integrity of the free market, or free enterprise system, without intervening in it. The term private property also needs clarification, for private ownership and control of property is a key component in the free enterprise system. In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are title, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what a person owns. In a free market economy, these aspects are unrestrained, so long as the owner does not infringe on the legitimate rights and claims of others. True ownership of property and freedom go hand in hand. They always have. Now let's compare the two systems of capitalism. In the competitive free enterprise system, capital or property is both owned privately and controlled privately. In the monopolistic system, holding title to capital can be accomplished privately or by the state. But more importantly, capital is controlled by the state or by the elite few who control the state. The Communist Manifesto which contains the basic program for all communists and all socialists, explicitly preaches the destruction and abolition of private property. Karl Marx understood the powers of controlling capital and so have all communists and socialists who have ever looked and still look to Marx as their leader. State-controlled capitalism results in high prices and low quality. After all, why would a monopoly strive to improve if it has no competition? On the other hand, honest, thrifty, and hardworking producers throughout the world prefer competitive free enterprise system for all. Here, low prices and high quality prevail because a variety of producers will seek to attract the widest amount of customers. Competition results in excellence and always has. Just as the political spectrum shows the range of government power, we can also plot the various economic systems along another spectrum. These forms of government control in the market stand in sharp contrast with a completely free market. In the last century or so, there have been basically four forms of state-controlled economies, all on the far left of the economic spectrum. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. In each, the government controls the capital. The difference among these is how much is owned or controlled outright by the government. In a fascist system, the government doesn't own businesses on paper, but it does control them. In Mussolini's Italy, even though he didn't hold title to businesses, he told the owners what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce, where to buy raw materials, who to hire, who to fire, and what price to charge. The rest, he said, was up to them. The fascist system is more efficient than other state control systems insofar as those living under it think they still own their businesses. Shopkeepers concern themselves with maintenance on the machinery, employee relations, painting the building and so forth, but the government controls owners through an array of taxation and regulations. Under Nazism, which means National Socialism, its proponents went one step further and acquired ownership of some corporations such as Volkswagen. However, Hitler didn't seize ownership of other industrial giants. He simply controlled them, just as Mussolini had controlled businesses in Italy. Socialism is where government officials acquire possession of major industries such as transportation, communications, and utilities in order to leverage control over the entire economy. Through ownership of these vital segments of industry and by creating government regulatory agencies, socialists gain control over virtually everything else. Finally, there is communism, the granddaddy of all in the economic sense. In a way, communism is more honest than fascism because all of the capital is owned and controlled by the state. There are no pretenses about it. Now let's combine political and economic systems because ultimately one never exists without the other. 
we see again that there are only two ultimate choices, a competitive free enterprise system in a republic or a monopolistic state control system under an oligarchy. A moral people have always been a vital element of America's strength. The founding fathers well understood the biblical teaching that righteousness exalteth a nation. They also knew that expecting a free market economy and limited government under a republic to endure without morality was expecting the impossible. James Madison cautioned that limited government alone was inadequate for our nation. And John Adams observed, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington stated, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Yet there are people today who think that liberty is license and that morality is unimportant or irrelevant to politics and economics. But as Benjamin Franklin added, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The alternative to Americanism is what has condemned most of the human race to live as slaves throughout the millennia. It is the idea that rights are privileges dispensed by an oligarchy according to the unlimited rule of men, that the state should control or own the nation's capital with all economic activity directed from a central power, and that morality is inconsequential, and that security is preferred over freedom and opportunity. Our nation continues to be steered off course, and the principles that led to America's greatness are being cast aside. The simple question for us is, do we continue to slide away from our nation's founding principles, or do we return to the kind of government we inherited? Time is running out for Americans who sense that something is wrong. They have to decide what kind of a country we shall leave for future generations. All that is needed is for a sufficient number of Americans to get involved in the fight for freedom and to return our nation to less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. Thank you to John McManus for that great explanation of the difference between a democracy and a republic, where clearly a republic is a permanent form of government, whereas a democracy must inevitably fall into, as he put it, an oligarchy of the elite. Sometimes we find that people have a difficult time letting go of the word democracy in describing our form of government. Personally, I never use democracy to describe our government, not even in a combination like democracy or a democratic republic or even a representative democracy or anything of that nature. It always leads to confusion. Now there are some elements in our form of government that are in common with democracy. As this slide illustrates, the concept of majority rule is in common in both a constitutional republic as well as a democracy. The difference though is what restrains them. In a true democracy, as demonstrated in the video, majority rule rules. There's nothing to stop it. Whereas in a constitutional republic, it is that constitution which prevents the government from doing things that the majority may wish, including trampling minority rights. So it's essential that we understand that in our constitutional republic, there are some things our government is not allowed to do and follow the constitution. The next place I want to go is a booklet also produced by John McManus entitled A Republic If You Can Keep It. There are a number of additional quotes that help us understand a broader picture of the dangers of democracy. 
First, as we go to page five, we have England's Duke of Northumberland. Back in 1931, he warned, the adoption of democracy as a form of government by all European nations is fatal to good government, to liberty, to law and order, to respect for authority and to religion. He goes on, and must eventually produce a state of chaos from which a new world tyranny will arise. He was concerned that Europe adopting democracy would lead to chaos. Now today, how are those democracies working out for Europe? Over the last few years, we've seen Europe on the verge of economic collapse. And our next quote will point to exactly why. This one found on page seven, near the top of the page. We have Alexander Fraser Teitler, a famous Scottish historian from the 18th century, where he warns a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. What are the challenges that Europe is facing today? Their loose fiscal policy is leading to financial collapse, exactly as he was describing. Their adoption of democracy has led them to the collapse they're facing today. Now, not everyone is opposed to democracy. There are some who speak favorably of democracy. You'll find lower on page seven and onto page eight, Mao Zedong. He is the famous communist dictator of China, talking about democracy in a favorable manner. He says, the democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution. And the socialist revolution is the inevitable sequel to the democratic revolution. What's he saying? If we have a democratic revolution, it will inevitably lead to a socialist revolution. Therefore, obviously, because he loves to promote socialism, a form of Marxism, he's promoting democracy because democracy will inevitably lead to socialism. When we see, like we have recently in Europe again, democratic revolutions, that's a red flag to me because it never leads to a freer people. Eventually, it leads to their collapse. Another that spoke in favor of democracy, we have Woodrow Wilson. An article he wrote called Socialism and Democracy, he's comparing the two and how similar socialism and democracy really are. Prior to being President Wilson, in 1887, he points out, state socialism proposes that all idea of a limitation of public authority by individual rights be put out of view, and that state consider itself bound to stop only at what is unwise or futile. What's he saying? Government power shouldn't be limited in order to protect the rights of the people. He's saying the only limit on government power should be what they feel is unwise or futile. Of course, they're the ones that will judge that. That's the vision of state socialism. It's only limited by their own good judgment. That's a little scary. Then next, he demonstrates how democracy and socialism are almost identical. He says, in fundamental theory, socialism and democracy are almost, if not quite, one and the same. They both rest at the bottom upon the absolute right of the community to determine its own destiny and that of its members. Men as communities are supreme over men as individuals. What he's referring to here as the rights of a community trump individual rights. This goes back to the video we watched earlier that majority rule can trample minority rights. What the will of the majority wants can trump your God-given unalienable rights that we talk about in the Declaration of Independence. Later, when he became president, promoting democracy, he says in 1916, he appealed to our nation to enter World War I to make the world safe for democracy. It shouldn't be surprising that it was during the Wilson administration that our nation began to think of itself as a democracy rather than a republic. The word democracy started to have widespread use across our country 
convincing us that truly we can do whatever we want as long as the majority goes along with it. So making the world safe for democracy. Next we have in 1940 President Franklin Roosevelt declaring that America must be the great arsenal of democracy. Again, protecting the idea of democracy around the world. And more recently, in 2003, we have President Bush, who portrayed the war in Iraq as the latest front in the global democratic revolution led by the United States. Now, that should be a huge red flag that when we see a democratic revolution, what does a democratic revolution inevitably lead to? Socialist revolution. When we have a global democratic revolution that we're promoting, are we not promoting socialism? In the eyes of Mao Zedong, that's exactly what we were doing. Now, President George Bush also spoke of the war as an effort to spread democracy. Now, with this new understanding of democracy, I began to realize that spreading democracy is not such a good thing after all. It leads people to a socialist state and to collapse, like we're seeing in Europe today. So with that, we have a solemn warning that we are not a democracy, we are a republic. And from that foundation, we'll begin our study of the U.S. Constitution, the limits of power that the government is supposed to be following. Thank you for joining us for lecture number one. Y'all join that? Did you enjoy that? How many people think we should go spread democracy in Ukraine right now? Spread democracy in Canada? No. Yeah. We should not be spreading democracy. We should be spreading constitutional republics. And even better, just, just spread Americanism. Spread our values, right? Um, I could not find a quiz. I think you handed all the quizzes out. Does anybody, do you have an extra one? Okay. Yeah, the one with the quiz questions. Oh, the other, oh, wait a second here. That one right there. Yeah, that one right there. Is that okay? Or, okay. Okay. So, um, if you're watching this from home, um, you, you can go to jbs.org. And you can download uh, these worksheets if you if you go to the ed education tab on our website and click Constitution Solution. You can go to um, a link. I, I believe it says Constitution is a Solution Manual and Lecture Guide. And 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 so if you go to that Constitution is a Solution Manual and Lecture Guide, and you go to page it's page 11 on the PDF. So, um, but anyways, um, if you have questions about that. Um, you can you can contact Pastor Gary and and uh, he'll help you with it. Um, the first question is: It wasn't what government did that made America great. It w it was what government was blank 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 that made the difference. Prevented from doing. Good job. Do we have prizes? No, we don't. Have, we have cookies in the back. We could give those out early. Uh, number two: The founders did not create a government. Dot 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 to to do things for people to take from some to give to others, they understood that when a government starts doing something for one citizen, it has to take from another to do so. And in the process, it gains control over both. Good job on that. The Constitution was written to govern blank, blank, not the people and not the states. Yeah, the, yeah, the government, you're right. Number four, the founders created a central government with strictly blank, blank. This left the states free to compete with one another to, do, to be the best state. The one with the late, least amount of taxation and controls, one where citizens would want to build a business and raise a family. So let's, let's go back to that first, lo first line. The, first, the founders created a central government with strictly blank, blank. Limited powers. Number five, J James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton wrote essays explaining the Constitution to encourage the people to support adopting the new form of government. These essays were collected into a volume known as the 
Good job. Draw a line connecting the form of government to the proper definition. A monarchy. Which one does that connect to? Rule by one. Oligarchy. Rule by a few. Democracy. Rule by a majority. Republic. Rule by law. Anarchy. Rule by no one. Good job. Okay, number seven. The rights of the gunman aren't subject to a majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Number eight. The essence of freedom is the proper blank of government. Limitation of government. Yeah. So number eight. The, the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. Number nine. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up within a tyranny of the elite. So we will end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Blank is the means of production. This is number 10. Capital is the means of production. 11. In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are Title's one of them. Use is one. There you go. Yeah, so it's title, control, use, and the ability to dispose. Number 12. State controlled capitalism results in blank, blank, and blank, blank. High prices, low quality. Way to go. Benjamin Franklin. Caution, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Exactly what we have in the White House right now, right? No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters, which is what we're getting, right? Scottish historian Alexander Tytler warned, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can blank themselves money, give themselves, vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. Now, this next one's tricky, so just so you know. 15, Chinese dictator Mao Zedong candidly admitted the democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution and the, I'm sorry, I answered that one for you, but this next one's the hard one. Okay, so the democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution and the blank revolution is the inevitable sequel to the democratic revolution. Is it what? Did, what did you say, ma'am? Socialist. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's socialist both times. Am I standing in the right place? Is this okay if I stand down here or is this? I, I, I like this better. Okay. <laughs> when asked what form of government the Constitutional Convention of 1787 had created, Benjamin Franklin replied, does anybody know what he replied? A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. In what ways is the government established by the Constitution a, re a republic and not a democracy? A democracy is raw mob rule, and what do we have today? I, I know it's questionable sometimes what we have today, but... Right, we're supposed to be ruled by law, right? Yeah. So you're so that's what we have today. So we we still have a republic. Um, if any of us were to be called a criminal on the street and taken into jail, what would we get? We'd get a trial, right? I'm sorry. A free and fair trial, and we would actually get an attorney that would represent us, right? So um, 
we, we still have a republic that works. Our sheriff still takes an oath to the, to the Constitution. Our sheriff um, believes in obeying the U.S. Constitution. And so um, that's, that's the nice thing about a republic is we are ruled by law. Um, why, why do democracies collapse? Why do they always collapse? And I, I think there's a quote I can read. We, we read that previous quote by Scottish historian Alexander Teitler. And, and so that was number 14 on the quiz. So why is it, do you think, that democracies collapse? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah. yeah they, they, they're trying to do, I mean, it, it's not supposed to work that way, but they are, yeah, by, by, by um, they do have strategies where California's trying to control more and more of, of the federal government. And, and yeah, the, the areas where there's more population, they do have more people in Congress. Uh, the U.S. Senate still has two representatives from every state, so in that case, um, you know, even the small states have the same representation of, as California. Uh, but um, the key is the U.S. House. Congress controls the purse, and you're going to find out in the next video. So the key is the U.S. House of Representatives, which California does have more representation in. Uh, but it's, it's our duty as Americans to look at ourselves and, and go, what am I doing wrong? And because we are getting it wrong here in this county. We're getting it wrong in Greenville County as well. Greenville County and Spartanburg County make one congressional district. And we've consistently had congressmen for the past decade at least that do not obey the Constitution 100% of the time. And so it's our duty, duty as a citizenry to be educated enough to where we demand our congressmen obey the U.S. Constitution and that's, and that's what's great about living in a republic. Yeah, but democracies always destroy themselves because as we learn in, in, um, in church, the root of evil is the love of money. And so once you find out you can get money from the government, as long as you vote for it, most people give into that. So, Not working out very well. I think everybody who, everybody who already got a check from the government this past, in the past few months, I think it's already been given... You know, with inflation, you know, we've already, you know, taken a bigger hit than the, any check that was given to us. So, uh, Read the quote from Mao Zedong in question number 15. So I'm going to read that quote. The, the Chinese dictator Mao Zedong candidly admitted the democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution, and the re socialist revolution is the inevitable sequel to the democrat revolution. What new perspective do, does this give to the recent um, democratic revolutions? And, and by the way, this is a little bit outdated. So this actually uses in here the re recent democratic revolutions in Egypt, Greece, and elsewhere. Elsewhere, This was about 10 years ago. But, but we, we've, we see democrat re revolutions happen all the time. In fact, they're happening in the United States of America right now. So what, what does this lead you to think with what's going on in the United States? Right, right. Yeah. Over and over and over, if you watch CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, they're constantly trying to tell us we have a democracy. And they know if they turn us into a democracy, we will eventually lose our republic. Right? I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, there's a few of them watching this on Facebook Live. But yeah, I didn't know they still had reruns of Captain Kangaroo, though, so they still got those on TV. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people not paying attention, but like I said, the, the key, especially for those who are Christians, is to look, point the finger at ourselves first and go, what am I not doing to help America? And that's, that's, that's really the, the key to it, because we can point fingers at everybody else, but really, how many of us are holding Constitution classes in our living rooms how many of us are participating in, in helping others 
understand uh, what a republic is. There's so many things that we ourselves can be doing, uh, and we we um, we lose momentum when we point our finger at others. And so, um, and that's and that's what the John Birch Society helps people with. We have all the tools you need to create an Americanist um, community. And the key is, is people just need to use our tools, and it, it, it does happen. And that's what we're doing here is we're reminding, a lot of this is just a reminder of who we are as a people, right? We are Americans, right? All of us here are Americans. And a lot of us have never learned this stuff. I, I have because I've taught this dozens of times. But for some of you, this is the first time that you're learning this. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame you for our problems. What I'm what I'm gonna tell you from here on out is now that you know the truth, please share it with others. And I'm gonna show you how easy it is to to share it just by using our website and sharing links and, and getting people to to go to our website and, 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 and use what we have available. President George W. Bush told us that we must go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan Afghanistan to spread democracy. Where is this international spreading, spreading of democracy likely to lead? Yeah. You'd make a good member of the John Birch Society because that's what we repeat over and over again. We don't want a one world government. We want lots and lots and lots of constitutional republics where people believe that they have God-given rights because that works. It really does work. And that's what the that people who want a new, new world order, this is what they want to take out of our thinking. They don't want, to, they don't want us to be reminded that we, we believe we have God-given rights. I remember when I first learned about this about 10 years ago, I remember I learned about it in middle school, but it wasn't really driven to my thoughts. And so uh, Ron Paul was running for president in 2012. So this is about 2011 during his campaign. And he told the audience, he's like, he said, we have God-given rights. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good to me. I'm a believer, so, but I didn't really understand what God-given rights were. But God-given rights are found in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and right, and life being our lives. That's easy, right? Liberty being, yeah, but not complete freedom because I can't destroy somebody else's liberty. So liberty has restraints on it, right? Um, and then pursuit of happiness, which is property and contracts. So we have, we have a right to bear the fruits of our labor, which means we shouldn't be paying property tax. We shouldn't be paying income tax. We didn't pay those when we were first Americans, but once, once they added those to what they could take from us, they just take more and more. Now we're stuck in the situation we're in. So we've we got to get that belief back so we can, we can restore Americanism and, and have, once again, a republic that isn't tainted by those trying to push us into becoming a socialist or communist country. Seems hard, but really it's simple if, if we just use the tools that we have available to us. That concludes uh, the workshop for today. We don't want to drag this out because we want you to keep coming back. Every class gets better and better. And so if you come next time, I think it's Monday of next week, will be class two. You'll learn more about, you know, things you can be doing to spread the truth to others so we can continue to live in a republic. And you'll learn more about the John Birch Society. And I do plan to be back here next Monday as well and to, to help help do this. So please bring more people. Uh, who brought the cookies today? You. Who made those little white chocolate? Thank you for that. I didn't have any of that before I got up here, and I felt like I didn't have any energy when I started. And I went back there, and I got, you know, I, sn I snacked. Oh, what's the name of them? Deer droppings. So I just ate some deer droppings. Well, I feel a lot better now that I ate some deer droppings. I guess that's... Thank you so much for making those. Those were those are great. And I guess all of you can have some of them once you once you go out there. If, if you, it's where he gets all his energy. <laughs> well, I should have known that when I walked in the door, and I should have grabbed them right when I started. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, invite others because there's. I'm um, believe me, you don't have to be at class one to to attend class two. So please get the word around and, and um
Pastor Gary, if, if you want to conclude this. Oh, sure, sure. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn about how our country was founded, and, and we just pray that more and more people will learn from the wisdom of the founders and learn from your wisdom, the biblical wisdom that you have taught us um, so that we can continue to live in places where there is liberty. And we just we do this for, for your sake and to, to create what you, would, you want us to create on this earth and places of liberty for our children and grandchildren. We love you, Lord, and we just pray for everybody to have a safe trip home tonight. And we uh, say this in Jesus' name. Amen.